Riddle me this. How do you decide who the best DC character is out of Batman, the Joker, and Harley Quinn? Simple. It's obviously the Dark Knight. That's terrible. I mean, I'm not even going to be shy about my bias in this one. I win the ultimate moral victory. I'll take that any day. Hello, my name's Jack Howard. Welcome to the screen test. I'm joined as always by the chief film critic at The Independent, Clarice Lockery. Hello. One third of the cyber nerds, Joe Akinwin. What's good? And this week, we have another cyber nerd, another third of the cyber nerds. Raven Delgado is here. Hello, mate. It's, it's like getting the Justice League here. together, isn't it? Yeah, Although yeah. it didn't take us four years to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Little current joke there. <laughs> Oh. Should we acknowledge this? <laughs> this is ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, this is I can barely hear you as well. <laughs> I don't know how he gets anything done. <laughs> this That's is a good question. Disrupting, if anything. Can you turn your neck? This, this, fine, yeah, there you go. It's the dark night all over. I, mean, I think it's fine. Look at that. Oh, <laughs> it's about to be a right in here. <laughs> Shazam is out on Friday on Prime Video. His name is Captain Sparkle Fingers. No, it's not. It's not my. That's not my name. Wonder Woman and Aquaman and the Boys is also included on Prime, and that got me thinking: What is the best DC character? Be it a superhero, a villain, an antihero, and what is their best live-action movie? And why is it The Dark Knight? Right, Joe? Hundred <laughs> percent. Why is it? It's absolutely The Dark Knight. I mean, I'm not even going to be shy about my bias in this one. You... I mean, you are wearing a Batman mask. Exactly. So I feel Thank like you. the die has Thank already you. been cast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to be a stereotype of my gender, age, and race, but I absolutely love The Dark Knight. <laughs> <laughs> I am that white guy who's nearly 30 who's like, The Dark Knight is a masterpiece. That's me. I feel it's like just really hard to take you seriously with that one. <laughs> You can't be, be a man dressed already. as Batman telling us how much you love Batman. <laughs> it's too oh, much. Sounds like Bruce Wayne, if you ask me. Deary me. Okay. Oh my God, unrecognizable. So Joe, you've picked right, quite rightly. Yeah, I mean, I picked the definitive Batman movie, the definitive greatest superhero movie of all time, The Dark Knight. Clarice, what have you picked? Like... <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm going to lose, but I went with my actual favorite thing that I love just deeply, and it's Harley Quinn and Birds of Prey. Yeah, what's the full title? Uh, Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation yeah. of one, Harley Quinn. Is it one, one Harley, Harley Quinn. Quinn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, nice. It sticks, doesn't it? Raven, what have you picked? <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it would be... Um justified to pick the Joker in between these two, so. so. It's gonna be an interesting conversation, especially because like I say, I'm not gonna hide the fact that you've all, I mean, the Dark Knight's setting a high bar. We've got Joker versus the Dark Knight versus Birds of Prey. You have to convince me why your choice is the best. Why me? Because I'm the judge that Gotham deserves. <laughs> But not the one it needs right now. <laughs> Listen, I mean, if we're talking about cultural impact. Let's do it. Um, I just feel like anything we're doing today with superhero movies, it really got birthed from The Dark Knight. You get what I'm saying? It came out 2008 and it was just, it's just a great movie. I think this, The Dark Knight let everyone know that, raw we can take the superhero thing seriously. We can actually make a film about superheroes and people perceive it as like a good movie. I mean, it's a crime thriller, isn't it? Ultimately, yeah, The definitely. Dark Knight is. It's very much, obviously, I mean, Nolan's not been shy about the fact that it was inspired very much by Michael Mann's Heat. 100%. I mean, and even the films, the themes in the movie, I think are, are so good. Like, obviously, with... Um, some of Batman's antics in a movie when he takes over everyone's cell phone mm -hmm. um, in the city, trying to hunt down a Joker. It's very, like, it's what we're, we're going through in the real world at the time when we was talking about um, how far should government surveillance go? Is Batman taking it too far? And lots of people will come with the argument that, nah, the best thing about the Dark Knight is the Joker. But I feel like the villain, Heath Ledger's Joker, also being the greatest villain and incarnation of the Joker. I appreciate Raven. you say that. No, no, no. No, no, you're, you're arguing another movie. Hold on. No, no, no. So get me. So um, that incarnation of Joker only lets Batman be 
the best hero, do you know what I'm saying, that he can be. And it also pushes him into a lane where it's like, I understand as a hero, the city does not need me now. So I have to step away from this and, and be the villain in the public's eyes. And that's something that we've just never seen in mm -hmm. comic book movies, period. Like it changed the game differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. The, the fact that it's, you know, a hero is only as good as his villain, first of all. And then the idea that these movies now exist, Joker especially exists because there was a massive... Um, Heath Ledger's Joker refreshed the idea that you could do the Joker on screen because no one had really touched it in live action movies since 1989. Since, you know, everyone was like, what's the point? Jack Nicholson is the Joker. Then Heath Ledger comes along and does that and we'll get more to that into cast. But in terms of cultural impact, I don't know how you can beat The Dark Knight. I mean, it, not only was it a cultural impact for superhero movies in general, but also movies like everybody wants like you wouldn't have skyfall one of the best james bond movies which is absolutely riffing on the dark knight i mean guys do your best like clarice and raven what have you got to say about cultural impacts of of your movies and and of the dark knight who wants to go first you raven go take first? it away you I'll spoke take first. first um well firstly uh this joker does what goes over a lot of people's heads when it comes to comic books, which is tell a story, tell what actually happens in real life and translate into comic books. So in this case, when this movie was made, no one was really talking about mental health. So what we do with this movie is this, we grab this fictional character and we explore, we, we dive into this deep issued um, topic that no one is comfortable to talk about. Yeah, but we could never get that exploration into that character without a movie like The Dark Knight setting up, listen, here, you can take these, you can take this genre of movies seriously and tell a story. And then that's what they go on and try and do with the Joker. But I feel like that Joker- They movie, tried to do? What? That's what it tried to do, yeah. That's what Joker, your movie, tried to do. No, that's it was, what it did. Well, I, it, I would argue, ahead, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna be brutally honest, I absolutely hate Joker. <laughs> Makes sense. And the reason, look, I, I am a mentally ill, failed stand-up, so I feel like, you know, I have a right to voice my <laughs> opinion in this. I, I, yes, I understand that it did tackle the, the themes of mental illness, but, what does it actually say? Because I come away from that movie with the message of like, hey, like every mentally ill person is one missed therapy appointment from becoming a serial killer, which I think is such a damaging message to put out into the world. And I appreciate that Todd Phillips and Joaquin Phoenix certainly did not intend that to be the takeaway of Joker. And, and I'm sure wanted to engage that topic faithfully, but I... When people talk about, oh, it's about mental illness, I think I always come back to the question of like, but what does it actually, what does it say? What is it telling us? What is it telling me as someone with a mental illness? What is it telling the people around me about like my relationship to society, everyone else, every other mentally ill person relationship to society? Like I, it, 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 that movie worries me a little bit, I'll be honest. I know what you mean. <laughs> like when I first watched Joker, I came away very confused about what I felt about it because I think... It is trying to take some big swings in terms of thematically what it's trying to do. And obviously it's got the face of a comic book character, but it's the depth of what it's going for in terms of what it's saying about, here's the meme, society, and what it's saying about mental illness and all those things. It's definitely doing that, but it doesn't seem to really know what its conclusion is. So I find it easier to disconnect all that all the messages and all the themes that it might be getting into and actually just go, it's a silly comic book origin movie. And that's, it's like, it's what everyone says about it. To me, it feels like someone's gone, oh, what if Martin Scorsese did the Joker? Like that, that to me was, it, it goes as far as that. And there's no more depth to that movie, you know, than, than that. I think you're right. It does tackle mental illness, but I agree that I think the conclusion that it draws that, you know, mentally ill people are, potential serial killers is is dangerous not not at all i think i think what what it does is just put a spotlight 
on that. You know, it, we're not. It it doesn't give you an excuse mm-hmm. for what the movie becomes. It's telling you where when there's there's no balance. This is where it can go. And obviously, they use someone like the Joker, who just has no real reasons to to do what it does. So this is just a guy who is a Joker. He's he's a com- he's a comedian guy. So his his whole life is like on a daily basis. He just goes out. He's surrounded by people, but he's alone. He tells jokes, but no one laughs at his jokes. People laugh at him. So that kind of has a detriment on him. Do you know what I'm saying? So to me, it's not about we're tackling it. No, it's just showing up this how this city is unbalanced and how it takes a toll to him because he doesn't start like that. It gets there through events that it goes on daily basis. I think the trouble I have is like, yes, but the fact that then it makes him violent towards others. I mean, statistically, people with mental illnesses are a bigger threat to themselves to anyone else. And I think... Yes, it's putting a spotlight, but I feel like it's a negative spotlight because I, I can't imagine anyone coming away from Joker feeling differently in a way that's going to like help society <laughs> to be bru- to just be brutal about it. And actually, in terms of cultural impact, I mean, both, both Heath Ledger and Joaquin Phoenix are the only two actors, apart from Robert De Niro and Marlon Brando for The Godfather, played the same role and got an Oscar for it. Heath Ledger and the jo- Heath Ledger and Joaquin Phoenix have both got Oscars for playing the Joker. Yeah. Like that's a cultural impact as well. That, that's insane. Yeah, how, it was the second one too. Yeah, to that, how yeah. much the Joker character has integrated itself into cinema in the last ten or so years. I just want that point to be for the Dark Knight's cultural it absolutely impact is. because obviously the Dark Knight opened a door for that. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Even the fact the Dark Knight made a billion dollars. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. this is. This is stuff that hadn't been happening before. The first film yeah. to use IMAX. In- yeah, it had 28 minutes of IMAX in it. Um, and it was just it was just a legit movie. And I feel like whenever, like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, The Dark Knight will be mm-hmm. that movie. It's that movie. It's, it's the movie we're always going to go back to and be like, this is the definitive Batman movie. Mm-hmm. In a world where has got 100 Batman movies, this is the one. And this is the thing as well, actually, in terms of cultural impact. I think you're hitting on something that's incredibly true because the Joker also made a billion dollars at the box office with a $50 million budget, which is insane. That's so, it's such a wild success. And I really, really hope that the lesson that Hollywood takes from that is let's make more individual, almost experimental movies using these very, very popular characters. And maybe we'll see a return on that, but I doubt that's going to be the lesson. I think what's going to happen is we're going to see, let's have a Lex Luthor origin story. Let's have a this origin. Like, what, I think people are going to look at need. villains and like go, let's do that now. I think that's what's going to happen. Yeah, we don't need that. Personally, I don't even think that the Joker having a solo movie like, works anyway. And I feel like that's why they took the the route they did with the tackling mental illness or whatever, because like he doesn't need an origin story. That is the That's precise kind of the reason in the dark night, he's got five different origin stories. Do you know how I got these scars? Do you know how I got these scars? Do you know what I'm saying? Like he doesn't need to be explained. Explaining a Joker takes away from how great the character is. He doesn't need uh, a beginning. Like he's just here. He's just a force of nature, and this is what we're doing. And he's with. the opposite of Batman. Yes. Batman, yeah. Like, that's it. the thing, the, the yin and yang, and I feel like that. they can't really exist without each other. Yeah, 100%. And, and they try and it's true love. get some of that in <laughs> to this. True love. They try and get, you know, where Bruce Wayne is there at a different age and things like that. They try and do that, but ultimately it is it is someone's vanity project going, I like I like Martin Scorsese movies. And it's been said over and over again, this is not a new point, but it basically is not as good as Taxi Driver, not as good as King of Comedy. Before we move on, do you have anything to say about the cultural impact of Birds of Prey? I'm going to try. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I mean, first off, I think it is actually a really important landmark in filmmaking because there's been this tradition with blockbusters of... Uh, you know, white male directors make their sort of standout debut film, then they get immediately picked up to make a blockbuster or franchise movie. And that never, ever happens with women, but it did this time with Kathy Yan. This is her second film. She made Dead Pigs, which was a standout at Sundance, but, for example, has only been recently released in the UK. That's how small it was. 
But Margot Robbie saw her reel, loved it, fought for her and got her this job. And I think like it doesn't seem massive, but I think it is really important in terms of like the progression mm. of, of women in film. It's it's a huge milestone. And it's just like I love Kathy Ann and I'm like so happy for her that this happened. <laughs> and two, on like a personal level, I know this is not cultural impact, it's like personal impact, but I grew up always wanting to be like Han Solo. I never wanted to be Princess Leia. I wanted to be Han Solo, the kind of messy, <laughs> weird, like not sort of an outcast, but like does the right thing in the end. And really throughout like mainstream blockbuster filmmaking, there really haven't been many example of, examples of female characters that fulfill that role. And, and that's really the reason that I was so like struck by Birds of Prey is having a character like Harley Quinn be the hero of her own film. And she is like chaotic and an anti-hero, but kind of sweet, has great fashion sense. <laughs> like, it, it's all these things that really like women haven't seen on screen, at least in terms of like this scale of filmmaking. And and like that's the reason like I I get it didn't really have like a huge cultural <laughs> impact and it's not going to change filmmaking forever but I think you know for a lot of women like they've really really I don't know they've attached themselves to Birds of Prey because they've seen something in it that they have not seen before I think you're right that if when I was watching it and I don't want to generalize because I'm I'm not saying that people can't enjoy this if they're not fitting into this category but it to me it felt like it was made for teenage girls in a very conscious way. It felt like it was going, this is for you. Like, mm. and, and I liked that, that I watched it and I, that, that I liked that. And I will say, interesting fact, like she, behind Batman and Superman, she's like DC's third most popular character. Like she's wildly popular. And, and they've often said that like, you know, she's she's kind of like part of the the triangle of DC, possibly more than Joker, because just in terms of the comics, like she has all these different runs of like just her Harley Quinn comics, and in a way that Joker doesn't really have this whole life of his own. <laughs> like he's like always connected to Batman. She's been able to go off and do all these things on her own. What I think you've argued really well is that the cultural impact of Birds of Prey, the movie, is that it's very much taking the stance that Harley Quinn is her own thing. She does not need to be linked to Joker in order to work, and I think it does that very well. So I'm going to give points accordingly. Obviously, The Dark Knight is getting top marks. Three points to The Dark Thank Knight. You. It is the, maybe the most cultural impact, the movie that's made the most cultural impact in our lifetime. I would probably say that there's an argument for that. And then I'm going to give Birds of Prey two points, and I'm going to give you an extra point for arguing that so well. Yay. And then I'm going to give Joker one point, because <laughs> that is riding off the coattails of The Dark Knight. And I agree that the, the representation of mental health is dangerous, to say the least. I can't believe this. The Dark Knight and Birds of Prey are both neck and neck with three points each, and The Joker has one point. Now let's get on to cast, because it feels like people are itching to talk about the casting of The Joker. So let's talk about that. Who's the best Joker, Heath Ledger or Joaquin Phoenix? I think everybody can agree, even people who don't like The Joker movie, Joaquin is good in it. Like, he's not delivering a bad performance. But to me... I don't think, I mean, please, do you disagree? He's delivering a good version of what he's doing. Yes. But I dislike what he's doing, if that makes sense. I don't like the childlike thing. I find it weird when you're trying to put that in the mental, and, and like, I don't know what that is meant to be. Um, and I find the dancing very weird. <laughs> I actually like um, Joaquin Phoenix's performance in Joker. Um, I feel like he does it well, but I just not, it's not on the level of Heath Ledger's performance. Do you think no. he feels like the Joker in the movie? No, no, not for me, no. Because I, I look like at Heath Ledger's I'm, Joker and I'm like, that's the Joker. Yeah, and I can't I even see Heath Ledger. There's, there's different... There's different incarnations of the character. So I'm fine with that incarnation of the character. But like, like I was saying about the Dark Knight being the definitive Batman movie, all the characters in this are the definitive characters. Like um, Heath Ledger's Joker is like the standard what you would think of if you was thinking the Joker. And I feel like Heath Ledger being able to like get it perfectly is mad because I remember when the casting came out, oh, Heath Ledger People was- People were dead. mad. It was, it was ludicrous. Everyone was like, no, he can't do it. Boom. And he 
dove into the role so deeply. And like you're saying, when, when you see him on screen, you don't know that's Heath Ledger. That is legitly the Joker from beginning to the end of the movie. His, and what's even crazy with that is like, his performance is so well-rounded. Like he's comic relief at times. Like he's, he's funny at times. He's scary at times. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, he's disturbed. But at the same time, it's like, you kind of like the character and it's weird that you like him because he's on a madness, but it's just there. Like, just him alone is is amazing. And then obviously you've got Christian Bell, um, who does a great job, Michael Caine. They're all like, the, the rest of the characters are thrown in there as well. And I feel like it's all like, it's just beautiful. It's just a beautiful cast. I want to specifically speak, speak about like the nuances and the differences between the characters, how, how they've portrayed the same character. And Clarice, please jump in. I know we're not specific, specifically talking about your movie Can here. we get to Margot Robbie eventually? <laughs> we can absolutely talk about Margot Robbie, I promise. You know, She's waning. <laughs> but I think, I think there's something about how Heath Ledger disappears into that role, but yet still, like that moment when he first takes off the mask and says that iconic... Um, whatever doesn't kill you only makes you stranger, stranger line. Like when I'm looking at it, I remember, I mean, I got to go see it again last year during the midpoint when the uh, lockdown was lifted for a few weeks and they were playing movies in the cinema. They played The Dark Knight in IMAX and I jumped at the opportunity to see that. And just the reveal again of seeing that face like on that big screen, it was, and I just believe that he could exist. Like I, I see that guy and I'm just like, that is terrifying no that man does exist he did <laughs> listen there is no <laughs> there is no denying that yeah i love just i love every part of it i even just his design as the character like the 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 face paint but it's all cracked and you can see his through fingers. it the scars they're there and they're covered up by the makeup and, and he's got the green hair but it's like half washed out like there's just a next level of commitment he goes to to, to get into that role. I don't um, know if people know this. I think it's pretty well known, but Heath Ledger like spent a month alone, locked in a hotel room, developing the voice and keeping notes and things like that. And it's just, yeah, the level of commitment for it. People think he was method. He wasn't. He was very much in and out of character on set. Sometimes when he was in a scene, he'd stay in character, but he'd come out of it. He's not like the Jared Leto sending rats to people thing, mm. which is ridiculous. <laughs> but Heath is like, when he's on, he's, he's on. And there's even a famous story in a documentary that somebody did about Heath Ledger, where somebody's talking, I think he was like on set with him. I don't know if he was an acting coach or whatever it was, but the scene when he comes out of the elevator to say, where is Harvey Dent in The Dark Knight? Apparently Heath was very nervous about that. He's like, oh, there's all these people here. And he was like, well, they're your audience, use them. And that's why that's, that scene feels so chaotic where the camera's mm. following him because he's just going around grabbing things and pointing the gun at people. He's just allowed to play. Yeah, and it's, some, it's just some of the, just the weird oddball stuff he does is what gets me is like, um, when the guy goes to take off Batman's mask and gets electrocuted and he jumps on top of him and he goes, <laughs> like stuff like that. I'm just like, yeah. It's it's just a it's a it's a whole nother level. Like we'll, I just don't think we'll ever get another Joker yeah. that is up there. Like and this is why I say like the Dark Knight is the definitive Batman movie. Like those characters are, are it. I tell you what though, um, Joaquin uh, Joaquin Phoenix spent a whole summer way a just an apple a day mm. to get that physical appearance. And that physical you know appearance I'm... is terrifying. It's, yeah. It's so uncomfortable. And this uh, this is what this movie does. It just literally makes you uncomfortable. But speaking that scene that you just mentioned about when the guy gets um, tasered and he does that whole blah, 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 <laughs> like joke. Uh, and this is where I find there is, there are traces that are common between that Joker and, and, and this Joker is that the way they switch up because he'll, he'll you know, he goes, blah, and he starts kicking the guy and then he goes back to serious. And this one, he like there's there's a scene where he gets fired for for having the gun. And he, he walks down the corridor <laughs> and he goes, Ah, I forgot to 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 um punch, punch, out. punch out. And he comes back. And he did that in real life. And everybody just stood there like it wasn't part of the script. And he was just like, What? I think that the contrasts all throughout, like I love the bit. On, yeah, I do. I do love the bit in Joker when somebody tells a joke about the um, the little person in the scene, 
and Joker laughs, and then as soon as he turns the corner, he just switches it off. Yeah. It's, it's, but yeah. then, can I add that scene ends with him uh, going past that sign saying, don't forget to smile, and then he crosses out the forget to, so it says, yeah. don't smile, which yeah. I would argue is not the greatest filmmaking choice. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry to bring the conversation down. Why is, just wanted why to point is that? that out. Why is that? Because I feel like your film is Joker. It's about a comedian. Like we get, we don't have to have him physically like cross it out. I think yeah. <laughs> like, I think there's, there's just quite a lot of um, very on the nose imagery throughout the whole thing. When well, I I think it would have benefited from being a bit more abstract and a bit a bit more subtle, a bit gentler with some of the things. Yeah, it it's just the point where it's like it's just hammering we, you over the we head. We understand. We understand. It's the irony that he's a clown and he's sad. <laughs> like I got that from fifty from the opening like, shot. 30 seconds in, I was like, I understand. You don't need to make him cross out the side. I, th <laughs> I think it just goes with with what he's going through. And the, there's one particular scene where he's talking, um, where he's at his session. And, he, you know, he tells her, oh, I've turned, I've turned my, my journal into, into a comic book where I have observations and, and funny stuff. So he's now converting the way he sees the world. So obviously when he... He's going through a bad patch and he sees that. It's like, well, no, like that's an observation. And he just automatically annotated that. So, and that goes back to his notebook, you know? So I think there's a consistency there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think yeah. There's, there's an argument for that. I guess I, I just don't, I don't, I don't like the whole concept of that person. And, I and, don't know. And, and it goes back to, I think you just, it, we're all seeing the same thing, but with just different eyes. Yeah. Well, let's hear about Harley Quinn. Let's hear about Margot Robbie. Has she become the definitive? Is she the, is she the Heath Ledger to the Joker? Is she, is she, is she that for, her, for Harley I mean, Quinn? I she's the only, kind of the only one. Do you think anybody else could <laughs> give it a go? Do you think, do you think she's like got big boots to fill? Yeah, I definitely. I think what's really interesting about Margot Robbie is obviously Suicide Squad did not do well, was not received particularly well, but she like shone so brightly, and that was the thing. Everyone who disliked Suicide Squad would still go, mm -hmm. "Oh, but Margot Robbie very good as Harley Quinn," and the fact that she managed to come out of that movie with kind of an instant power. Like what I love so much about Margot Robbie is that she understands her power as a star. And even before Suicide Squad had been released, she went straight to Warner Brothers and started pitching Birds of Prey and said, I want to do this. I want to have control over who Harley Quinn is and not have it just like handed up to me as a play by the studio. Like this is the character that I want to portray. She went away for for weeks and she she read through all the comic books and she would be texting like sending p images of panels to Christina Hodson the screenwriter going oh we should draw on this we should draw on this so she she studied the character knew it inside out and and then I think like delivered something that to her was like quintessentially Harley Quinn and I really I I love that I love a star like taking her own power and going right I'm gonna make the version of me that I want I'm not gonna let Hollywood dictate to me what I become and she produced it under her lucky chap entertainment banner which has also got on to like produce promising young woman so making all these interesting female-led stories and I don't I just I think that's awesome yeah. <laughs> like it's it's not the most like okay she didn't get nominated for an Oscar <laughs> she didn't win an Oscar it's a different type of role though this I mean I'm sure yeah. you could like I say the, the movie I'd like to see of Harley and Quinzel becoming that character that I think you could make a really interesting interesting psychological thriller about but they haven't done that yet yeah but that's not necessarily i think what's interesting is that like she decided for herself kind of what the tone of harley yep. quinn would be and i think we're going to see that in the james gudd movie yeah, yeah. Well, that's she the, said issues, i want i want to make a relatable woman that women can come and see my movie and look up and understand and go i know that girl <laughs> she's the party girl she's like the fun chaotic mess and but she she's got a heart of gold and we love her like i I, I love that she made that conscious choice to not just instantly go, oh, let's do the gritty origin story. Yep. She went, no, I want to do something different with this character. And, you know, it's not everyone's it's not everyone's cup of tea. <laughs> but I I love that she just put her foot down and she said, this is this is what Harley Quinn's going to be. And I think she delivers that version of Harley Quinn perfectly. So to bring this to a close, obviously three points to The Dark Knight. 
it's purely for Heath Ledger's Joker, but also I agree that the the remaining the sort of the surrounding cast we even touch on um, Maggie Gyllenhaal, who I think is great in it. I think that um, Aaron Eckhart, who plays Harvey Dent and Two Face, I think he's fantastic. Yeah, we didn't even talk about that. Smart. Yeah, I can't believe we didn't <laughs> talk about all this stuff. I am gonna give for the cast. I am gonna give Joker two points because I did like that cast more personally and you know i am biased i can't help it um but i do like what you're talking about i just don't feel it the same way you do clarice but i respect the hell out of it i respect the good fight that you're that you're, you're giving <laughs> I'm it trying my best. yeah and i do like margot robbie <laughs> right okay so as the point stands the dark knight is leading with six points clarice just behind birds of prey with four points and the joker is in third place with three points and now we're going to move on to memorable scene. I want to start with Birds of Prey, I think. What, what is it from you that, like, what's what's the scene that you would love to just watch over and over and over again? Is there one that just sort of does it for you in that way? I'm torn between two. Do two, then. There's well, no rules. The, the, num the number one, I think, is the, the fight scene in the, like, the merry-go-round area. Because... I think that it's the amount of detail that I absolutely love. And they got um, Chad Stahelski from the John Wick movies yeah. to his team to do the the stunt choreography. The choreography does feel very showy and it feels like it's making a point of that as well. Like it's going, look yeah. at this, like look at these big wide lenses to show you all the fun slow motion moves that we're doing. And also like I, my sort of like very, very general issue with a lot of superhero movies is that I never feel like the weight of the punching is so like nimble and <laughs> that they, I just don't, I don't feel involved because it doesn't feel like there's any stakes. It's just like people in spandex slapping each other, <laughs> which is very generalized. But what I really like about Birds of Prey and using that John Wick-esque uh, stunt, stunt choreography is that there's a lot of emphasis on like the brutality of the punches and like if you look at Harley Quinn at the end like she's yeah bloodied and bruised and and looks like she's actually been through a fight and so it's the combination of, of that like just really great stunt work and also like the the hair tie detail I think is such a just like really nice like relatable detail because even in this giant fight they are still very much their characters and they fight in the way that their characters would fight. And so like Renee Montoya fights like a cop would <laughs> and Huntress fights like a trained assassin. And she has that great bit where she's like, I don't know if they're tongues. It's like a line of tongues and she's like leaping across them like that and shooting the guys down. And, and yeah, I think it, it, it just is so beautifully put together. It's like a really good balance between action and character. And I also really liked the bank heist with her choosing to not yes. use lethal weapons, but glitter. fireworks or glitter. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That's terrible. <laughs> oh my God. That I is terrible. That, was fun. I, uh, well, it's fun. that whole thing is terrible. The pain in his face. Right, nah, that, that scene hurts me because it's like, you've Why? got these police officers. Run, piggy, she's walked run. in. She's shooting people. Like, no one tries to shoot her. Not one person. Like, he runs down the stairs. He's standing right, um, he's standing right next to her. And he just does nothing. Yeah, because so cops nah, are... Um, it's too cops. much. And then he the just gives up the information afterwards. <laughs> no. I think it's, I think it's the, the point of that scene, though, and actually the tone of the movie feels like you're just, okay, we're just going to watch Harley storm this place in a really fun way and just enjoy the sort of visuals of it. That's what I got mm. from that scene. Yeah. Anyway. And also my yeah. other favorite scene is the when she's running away from Renee Montoya with the sandwich because what I really like about Birds of Prey is how Gotham is depicted because it is very different. And, and, you know, Gotham is always meant to be New York, but it never looks like New York in the Batman movies because everyone's just like, it's, gray and cold and everyone's like white and wearing woolen coats <laughs> like it doesn't really feel like a real place but in this one you have all this like heightened like ridiculous stuff going on but the place that she's running through with her egg sandwich is it looks like new york and it feels like new york it's like a busy diverse colorful place where there's lots of stuff going on and people and what i really like about this film is you get to see these characters like do people things <laughs> like she goes to get a sandwich then she goes to the club and she gets really drunk and it does feel like a breakup movie it is a breakup movie yeah like, I know, that's, but that's, that's what it, it is it, it yeah. does feel like a superhero breakup movie yeah, and I think that's what like really hits hard about it is that it's 
it's such a, like you have like Batman and Superman and they're dealing with like the weight of, of gods. power and gods. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, that's great. I don't relate to any of that. I do relate to having a breakup and being really sad about it afterwards. Like, who doesn't relate to that? And then to put it in this ridiculous world, but still to have these really, like, grounded moments. And, okay, I'm going to add one more scene that Please. I love. <laughs> Which is after she goes to the club and she gets really drunk and she gets taken advantage of by a man and it, it looks like she's about to be put in the back of a car and you see Black Canary walk out of club. She's about to go home, get in her car, and she sees this happen. And she has this moment of like, hey, I hate this woman, but like female solidarity, let me step in and take these guys out. And it's so interesting to me because, yeah, the, the, the fight scene and everything around it is heightened and ridiculous, but the emotions of these two women, what they're going through, that sort of... I see you moment. Like, I've got your back. I've got you. Like, and that, that scene is, is also not, it's kind of played for laughs in some ways as well. Like when Harley yeah. goes, I had that. And then she just falls over. Yeah. And it, it's, it's really well balanced because like that's, that sort of interaction between women is so everyday and so normal. And I think a lot of women watching that scene are just going to go, oh, yeah, yeah, that situation. Like mm -hmm. women looking out for each other when they may not know each other or may not even like each other. You just have those moments where you, you've, you've got somebody's back. And I think that's what you keep seeing throughout this film is, is the combination of Glitter, hyena, <laughs> ridiculous, like fashion, over the top, but also the actual interactions between characters are, are way more grounded than anything you would see in any other comic book movie. But what you just said about feeling like Gotham and the New York comparison, like feeling like you understand the city, I would say that I've never felt the weight of Gotham City more than in Joker. I think that that's a real compliment for, for that. Um, what are the memorable scenes that you're choosing from, from that movie, Raven? <sighs> Man, there's a few. Um, some of them I, I definitely know when over people's heads. Um, I'll give you a quick one. When he goes in, he's at his, um, his um, session and he hands over his journal. I hope my death makes more sense than my life. Yeah, right? And he says, sense. <laughs> and she reads sense now that's like a bar because usually what it says is if it doesn't make dollars it doesn't make sense that to me as someone who loves metaphors and stuff like that that's just mind-blowing how but I, I i think that bit is genuinely like one of the best jokes in it and i like that he just gives a little laugh to, i like that the i like yeah. that arthur sits there and just goes <laughs> And, and she, she doesn't get and it. she doesn't get it. Like, she doesn't get it. And even she switches up sense with sense. Like, I think the metaphor there is so sick. But one of the main ones that, that, that got me is when he catches his first body and he runs, he runs, he gets to the top, to the bathroom and the cello kicks in. And the, the cello in this Hilda movie... Hilda daughter score. <sighs> she is... Listen, I'm a massive fan when it comes to movie scores it just does something to me it just brings something out of me i just i just love scores and he's just in there and usually a normal person would hide the gun well that's what was scripted do you know do you know this yeah 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 that's what was the scripted as well yeah and he, he was gonna go in hide the gun i think he was gonna be sick rub the makeup off his face right that's and, what was scripted but that's not what joker does right because the joker the character himself there's nothing that can be held against him. And that's what makes him the Joker. That's what makes him the, the most um, dangerous villain out there because regardless what you're gonna get off him, he doesn't care, you know, you can't hold him down to it. So it, it, it's in this bathroom, cello kicks in, and it feels like this is where the Joker starts to come out. To me, it feels like every time the music played, especially with the cello, the Joker was coming out a bit, bit more. And then at the end, he fully embraces it when he comes out in uh, Moray's show. So to me, that's one of my favorite uh, yeah. uh, moments. The dancing scene in the bathroom, that was the bit when I was seeing it for the first time and I remember being very captivated by it. That just feels like he's free. It feels like, for the first time, it feels like he's calm mm -hmm. and he knows himself and he's comfortable with himself and it's private, but it's euphoric. Like that moment there, I think his, 
I think he elevated that. I think it was Phoenix's idea, Joaquin Phoenix's yeah, idea to do that. He the just dance. played the music and he just started doing it. Yeah, and I know? think that, and, and also the beautiful camera work that follows his movements and it feels, I mean, it feels improvised in the best way. That is, for me, a huge compliment to that movie. I would love to talk about, though, the dance he does later down the stairs which again has become almost like a meme now. This movie yeah. got memed quick. <laughs> Very, that like everything walking, else in life these days. <laughs> <laughs> he got, he's dancing down the stairs, but he's dancing down the stairs to Gary Glitter. And that I think is a strange choice. It's a strange choice. Mm -hmm. And it might be an intentional choice because of the context of what mm -hmm. Gary Glitter did and who we found out he was. And the fact that maybe the audience is supposed to be tapping their feet and thinking this is cool until we realize, hang on, what are we, what are we watching? Like, what is this? But I also don't know if Todd Phillips is very aware of what that song represents. Because in America, that song is used as an anthem at sporting events all the time. Like if you hit a home run at baseball, they'll play that. If they, if you do that, if you win a game at basketball, they'll play that song. Right. So that's what that song is in America. Whereas to us here in Britain, that is not what that song makes us think about. Right. And it's just strange that whether it was coincidence or not, I think it's a very interesting uncomfortable choice for that moment. Arthur is like a, a caterpillar, right? Every time he starts dancing, there's a piece of music. He's breaking out of his cocoon, right? And when he gets to that stairs, that stair, that uh, uh, Bronx staircase, mm -hmm. which is also, I don't know if you guys know of uh, Celeron staircase in, in Rio de Janeiro. Okay. Right? There's, there's an art form to that. There's a compliment there. And I feel that if you're not tapped into that, you won't respect it. You won't enjoy it as much as someone else who has that kind of information, that kind of um, artistic behind it. So when he's playing that, it's almost like I'm out. I'm, I'm celebrating, you know, I've, I've, I've won. I'm no longer this guy from the beginning of the movie. Mm -hmm. I am now this joke. And guess where he's going to? He's going to Murray's show where the movie ends. Like the, he is uh, now so the I really Joker. I really like the scene on the stairs. I like, I like, you know, the imagery of the stairs being this, like, and they are monolithic. Like they, they go on seemingly forever and he has to, you know, um, work his way up them every single day. And then when he becomes who he thinks he's supposed to be, he dances down them and takes control over them. The scene directly following that when he runs away from the police, I wish he was enjoying that more. He's the Joker. Like surely, like he should be like, ah, you're never gonna catch me. But he's he just looks actually afraid. And yeah. I wish there were some there were some things in it occasionally where I'm just like, well, why did you not? Just for me, it doesn't quite hit the bullseye sometimes. Gotcha. Um, for me, if we're talking about uh, memorable scenes, obviously I, we're gonna talk about the interrogation. Please don't talk about the interrogation. We're obviously gonna talk about the interrogation. <laughs> um, but there's. There's the interrogation scene, which I think is great. I also love um, the hospital scene with Joker mm -hmm. and um, Two-Face where um, Joker comes in in a nurse's outfit and uh, pretty much sets Two-Face loose like, and, just, and just breaks down to him that like he made the plan, but he's not the cause of the issue. Like, and I feel like all of the dialogue with the Joker is is just so it's so sick when he's just deconstructing the world like he's letting everyone know how he thinks about the world and how everything they're doing is a joke. Well, the Do interrogation you know scene and the hospital scene are essentially the Joker trying the same technique on two yeah. different people, yeah. and you've got a corruptible person and an incorruptible person. It's just it's interesting to see how one works and how the other one doesn't. Yeah, I mean, and I I just love it, and I just feel like it's just even going back to Heath Ledger's performance, like. You just believe him. Like when he's in that interrogation scene and he's breaking it down to Batman and Batman's attacking him and beating him up and, and he's laughing because he and he tells him, he's like, like this doesn't matter, like well, what you're doing. Going yeah. back to what Clarice was saying about feeling the weight of of the violence in superhero mm. movies. I think Christian Bale he, really he hits really punched him in the him. face. Yeah, he really yeah. punched him. Like, really I remember seeing him. that when I was 16 years old when this film came yeah. out and like being very uncomfortable with how I mean, just to throw against the glass and yeah. then the constant yeah, the brutality of it. Yeah, I, I just love it, man. There's something so, like, just grounded. Obviously, the whole Batman, Christopher Nolan Batman universe is grounded, but, like, those scenes where it's just man-to-man, one-on-one, mm -hmm. like, we're going at it, and 
Batman's force and everything he's got, it just means nothing to when you're dealing with chaos and anarchy and that's what the Joker just breeds. I mean, I just I just think those, those scenes are so gangster. Yeah, and that, I mean, everything that has been said about the Joker and Batman has probably already been said, so I'm not saying anything new here, especially about this specific interpretation. But that um, interrogation scene, I think, is a masterclass in character and filmmaking. One of the most, uh, the bookmarks of it is when the Joker says, you're a freak like me, the camera work, which is constantly gliding between the two characters in these two close-ups, it jumps over the 180 degree line. And if people don't know what that is, it basically means that a camera is positioned on the same side of the line in order to maintain the audience's interpretation of geography, of space in the, in the room. And in that moment, it breaks that rule. So if the Joker is on the right side of the screen, it cuts and so is Batman. And it just places them in the same position visually. So even if you're not understanding that that's what it's doing, it's going in subconsciously you're, that's, that you're feeling that with the filmmaking as well as what the script is telling you, as well as what Heath Ledger's performance is telling you. It's all giving you one story. And there's a consistency to that that I think is underappreciated in, in, at this level. And I think that's why I think Christopher Nolan is one of the best filmmakers working is because of the details like that, like the specifics and the, yeah, I think it's, I agree with you. I think that the demonstration of that stuff is incredible. I mean, even with the hospital scene, I just love as well the um, the reveal of Harvey's face because it's like for Christopher Nolan not doing like a ton of like special effects and stuff in these movies, just to have that reveal when then um, later he drinks the water and you see it mm. actually run through. The CGI on it kind of holds up as his well. His face, yeah, it still looks good today. So, I mean, I'd love that he he got that in there. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, because you'd think, how, how could I do a Two-Face in my grounded real Gotham and he pulls it off in a way you're believable and you never question it. And um, that Two-Face character, I think, really utilized well in the movie. So yeah, I and I, I like as well that it's not left for a sequel. I think mm. some people complain that we could have left Two-Face alive to have the third Batman movie be him as the, but the movie wouldn't work as well. Yeah. He needs to die yeah. so that we are left on the note, you know, the very famous ending of Batman taking up the, the villain um, role essentially. I'm not the biggest Batman fan, but one thing you gotta give Batman, Batman Gotham, and what comes with it, I don't think any superhero touches that. Mm -hmm. oh, thanks for passing me the trophy, really. <laughs> no, <this is> <laughs> you know? Okay, my final uh, points before we do the IMDb rounds for for that for memorable scenes. Obviously, I'm going to give full marks to The Dark Knight. Three points. I'm going to give two to Joker because I do think that the dancing scenes are pretty great. Poetry, poetry. And I'm sorry, Clarice, I'm going to give one point to Birds of Prey. I just don't see it the same way you do, but I do appreciate how much you enjoy it. And Thank I like that you. you enjoy it. I win the ultimate moral victory. I think you do. <laughs> of just enjoying the movie I picked yeah. very much. <laughs> I think that there's nothing wrong with that. So at the moment... <laughs> The Dark Knight is obviously winning with nine points. Birds of Prey and Joker both have five points each. And now we're going to go to the IMDb rating round. How do you guys think your movies are going to do? What's going to be at the top? What's going to be at the bottom? Dark Knight, Joker, Birds of Prey. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there's only yeah. one way to find out. Let's start with the Joker. Let's see how that goes. Alexa, tell me the IMDb rating for Joker. Joker has an IMDb rating of 8.4 out of 10. That is good. Do you know what? That is higher than I expected it yeah, to be. Yeah, for me as well. it's such and, a controversial movie. Yeah. And I was about to say, I'm very surprised for a movie that gets a lot of slack, mm. a lot of misunderstanding. But it also has a lot of love behind it as well. It's crazy yeah, I think, and that, I think that comes with the, um, the acting and the script behind it. I think those two, and obviously the score. Yeah, the score's score, incredible. Come on. I think those help out, you know, with all the criticism it got and the misunderstanding. So yeah, 8.5, I'll take that any day. Let's just get the dot now out of the way. This is obviously, it's, it's, gonna be it's probably got like a 10. Nine. What do you think it's gonna be? I feel, I don't know. I, I, I wanna say it will be like a 9.5 or something crazy, but I've got, I don't if it doesn't know. Get it's, it's IMD, up, yeah, I'm upset. I'll be upset. I'm, be, be, I'm gonna go like 8.7 <laughs> or something. I think something. it's in the top. 25 or something in the most popular movies on IMDb or something like that. I don't know. I'm going to go 8.7, um, something like that. 
Alexa, tell me the IMDb score for The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight has an IMDb rating of 9 out of 10. Wow. 9 out of 10. Is that the highest Are you surprised? Movie we've had on it. No, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised because IMDb, we rarely get 9s. Mm. Oh, nines okay, and 10s, okay, we okay, rarely okay, get okay. it. So that's why I'm shocked. But Does The Dark Knight not do it for you, Clarice? I like it. It's fine. <laughs> it's just, yeah, yeah. She just she likes it. No, I, like it. <laughs> I like it a lot. I think the, I don't know, the message of it doesn't really... I, the, my thing with Batman is that he is a rich man who has just decided to go, like, take over the streets Preach. without anyone's permission. And that's quite a dark concept. And I, it really I is. would be more attracted to a film that I think really, like, wrestled with that. And I don't think any film so far has Come really, on, really done. Well, I'm Come hopeful on, to go really morally dark. Like, I know that The Dark Knight is dark in other ways, but to really be critical of that yeah. character, I would love to see that. Alexa, what does Birds of Prey have on IMDb? Birds of Prey has an IMDb rating of 6.1 out of 10. It's a bit lower than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, well... <laughs> There were men who really didn't they, like this I literally movie. was about to say, there is, there's probably a backlash from... <laughs> probably just because women were in it. So that Such means that the final points, Birds of Prey has six, Joker has seven. And the reigning champion, four in a row for Joe, it's the Dark Knight, obviously. We knew it at the start, but yeah, we, we knew we're it. here anyway. It makes me sick. Anybody you'd like to thank? I'd like to thank um, Gotham City. I appreciate you guys. And uh, Bruce Wayne for sponsoring this. Yeah. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? Of course you are, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching, everybody. Did we get it right? I think we did, obviously. But uh, is there a DC movie or a DC character that you think that has a, a, a movie that we should have been speaking about? Let us know in the comments below. If you want to catch up on some great DC films, Shazam is out on Friday, Wonder Woman's on there, Aquaman, The Boys are all included on Prime. Next week, we're going to be going undercover and trying to find out what cinema's greatest secret agent of all time is. Could it be Bond? Could it be Bourne? Could it be Austin Powers? Who knows? <laughs> Come back and find out. Bye-bye. <laughs>